Hello students, today I am going to talk about the concept of Hindu temple with the aim to study the evolution of Hindu temple along with a thorough analysis of its plan and the spirit behind its making. This would also give us a journal idea about the ritual and beliefs of Hindu religion. The Hindu temple concisely embodies the fundamental morals of Indian life and thought. Combining the excess of a world pillar, the cube of a sacrificial altar and the body of a palace to house an image of divinity. It represents the cosmological imagery in an aesthetic grab. Ever since man became a homo sapien, he has also been homo religious and he has built temples and worshipped in them since that time. Man has a basic capacity to wonder and to reach out into the unseen. A great mountain, a vast gorge or the source of watercourse would unsurprisingly aggravate in man a sense of obscurity, splendor and sublimity. These were regarded as divinities and worshipped by the early men with awe and adoration. Similarly, unusual objects like an odd shaped stone, a piece of meteor, the unusual shape of decayed tree trunks created in men not only inquisitiveness but a certain feeling of respect. This sensitive approach of men towards unusual lead to the worship of such objects and further to the origin of shrine. The early man believed in the device of compelling events to follow his imaginations. For this, he drew magic circles with sketch of animals he desired to hunt in it or engraved on a rock a wild animal with an arrow stuck in its body. He also have mumbled a few magical chants on this small pebble and carried them when he went out to hunt. His success in such a hunt was therefore ascribed to this ritual or icon and thus this ritual became a regular practice and the icon was preserved. When he was not carrying the icon, he placed it in a special spot with care and zeal and this spot was a shrine. It was plain ground cleaned for the purpose or a simple stone platform as a seat for the icon outside his cave or rude hut probably under a nearby tree. To guard it against intruders or lifters, he had fenced around it or built for it a crude cover. The shrine structure thus comes into being. The shrine itself was regarded as holy as it was considered to share the mana of the icon that resided in it. The icon that was placed in the shrine was either natural or a simple art piece so man poured his artistic skill into the shrine to satisfy his artistic abilities and this gave the shrine a mysterious and beautiful look. The stupas have been well known in India from Buddha's own days. This Buddhist adoption was a massive hemispherical structure filled with earth, pebbles and stone, mantled by bricks and covered by stone slabs. It was erected on a broad circular platform called Medhi, providing a passage for ceremonial circumambulation and fenced by a running railing called Vedika. On top of this plain tumulus was a quadrangle terrace called Harmika, over which was placed a parasol called Chatra, signifying spiritual sovereignty. There is a measure of truth in saying that the Hindu temple is a successor to the Buddhist stupa. Cave shrines chronologically paralleled the Buddhist stupas. The first full-scale Hindu temples were cut from a single rock or hill. These temples were limited in size only by how large a cliff could be found for the construction. Rock-hewn temples reached their peaks under the reign of Krishna I of the Rashtrakuta dynasty in the western Deccan plain. The five monolithic shrines in Mamalampur called Rathas, built by nursing Verma I, represents a major change in the plan of the shrine. An icon carved by a sculptor replaced the concept of storing relic in the cellar and the chamber containing icon was opened to the worshipper. 
the shrine appeared like a hut because of its square plan and the pyramidal roof. Three out of the four doors are blind, only the door facing the icon being open. The blind doors too had the representation of the same divinity, thus maintaining the concept of the four Dornas of the stupa. Further, the sanctum which is an innovation is a small one, admitting but one worshipper at a time. The shrine was no doubt public, but the idea did not accommodate the community assembly as yet. This may be seen as the beginning of the monumental temple. In the canonical description, it is the sanctum alone that constitutes the real temple. Here is therefore the basic shrine. The Guptas were great temple builders and the earliest of the extent an independent structural temple in North and Central India which have withstood the ravages of time belong to their period. They were the ones who initiated the practice of keeping the icon in Garbgre and the structure was enclosed by the courtyard which later housed a complex of shrines. The Shikra as a monumental spire on the top of the sanctum evolved in the 5th century probably under the patronage of Gupta kings. Thus, the credit for evolution of the monumental style in Hindu temple architecture goes to the Guptas only. The first example is that of the modest structure at Tigawa near modern Jabalpur. It has all key features of early Hindu temples, an inner garbhagre surrounded by an ambulatory path or cellar, an outer portico with columns in the front and a flat roof. The early Gupta age architecture reached its peak with the construction of the fabulous little Shiva temple at Deogar in the Jhansi district. This temple is significant for various reasons. The first and the foremost, the flat roof is replaced by a raised structure above the Garbhagre, thus giving the upper part of the sanctum a pyramidal shape and hen enhancing the grandeur of the shrine. The whole structure was placed on a pedestal which added to the increase in the appearance of the height. The second notable point is the portico which does not face only in one but in all the four directions. There is also the usual carved exuberance on the pillars. By the 4th century AD, the North Indian temples assumed a definite nuclear architectural identity which was gradually extended horizontally as well as vertically till by the close of the 7th century it introduced a culvinier spire called Shikra that constituted its distinctive cognizance. The broad geographical, climatical, cultural, racial, historical and linguistic differences between the northern plains and the southern peninsula of India resulted in distinct architectural styles. The Shastras, the ancient text on architecture, classify the temples into three orders. The Nagara or the northern style prevails in the land between Himalaya and Vidya ranges. The Dravida or the southern style between that river and Kanyakumari and the Visara or the hybrid style between Vindhya ranges and the river Krishna. The Nagara temple is square or cruciform in the plain and its shikra has a vertical emphasis. The Dravida on the other hand emphasizes the horizontal aspects. Its shikra is octagonal or domical or in the shape of a vaulted roof. Another distinguishing feature of this type is the tall and storied towers on gateways. But this is a later innovation. The Vesara is circular in plan or apsidal and combines the shikra features of the other two types. The Hindu temple is designed to bring about contact between men and the gods. It is here that the god appears to men. The process by which this contact is made comprises a series of ideas, beliefs incorporating a complex symbolism. Dynamic rituals and ceremonies permit a realization of these ideas through which the Hindu temple functions as a place of transcendence. 
a place where men may progress from the world of illusion to knowledge and truth. Talking about the subject matter, the Hindu deities whose grace is invoked for salvation is worshipped in the form of an image or symbol sanctified to fit it for the God's residence. As in the earliest native cults, worship is primarily the sacrifice of service and sustenance. Like a supreme personage, the deity incumbent in his image is awakened from the sleep of non-manifestation, greeted with flowers, bathed anointed, adorned, fed, honoured in accordance with the tradition of circumvallation, entertained with dancing, confined with his wife and paraded through the town in the glorious rathas on festivals. Worship is not congregational, it is performed by individual called Pujari, as he wills or more regularly at the principal times of the day by the priest whose caste and consurrection fit him to represent the community at large. In practice, therefore, it requires the provision of little more than a cellar, a porch and perhaps a vestibule to house the image and shelter the individual devotee with a hall or pavilion large enough for ritual dancing or banqueting. Given no clear distinction between Hindu religious and secular life, beyond provision for worship, the temple is the centre of intellectual and artistic endeavours, promoting the development of painting, sculpture, architecture and the performing arts as well, as philosophy and theology. As the nucleus of the community, as hostel, hospice and hospital, sanctuary and school, its expansion over the centuries provided facilities needed to feed and shelter priests, pupils and the poor, as well as often extensive bureaucracy that handled the charities and employed the servants. However, of course, the building of the Hindu temple goes far beyond mere practicalities. To the Hindu, the temple is the abode of God, who is the spirit imminent in the universe. It is therefore designed to bring about contact between men and the gods. It is here that gods appear to men. The temple, known by such terms as Devalya, Shivalya or Deviyatana, hence Worship constituting the living use of temple starts with the initialization of life in the form of a deity in the sanctum. The deity dwelling in the temple symbolizes the king of the kings and is consequently offered regal honor, consistent with the concept of God as supreme ruler of the universe. Just as the royal palace has a throne room, a private audience hall, and a public audience hall, the temple has a sanctum, an inner hall, and at times an outer hall. In course of time, the temple came to possess many subsidiary structures for the various temple rites and ceremonials. The Indian temple in its essential forms, whether in the north or in the south, consists of a sanctorum or garbhagre, meaning the womb cell, it is a dark small square cell where the main deity invariably carved in stone is installed. On the roof of this cell rises a shikra or tar also called as the vimana. The doorway of the sanctum which always faces eastwards open into another rectangular shamble which is called the antrala or vestibule. The vestibule is the intermediate chamber between the sanctum and a pillared hall called mandapa where devotees gather at the time of worship. Entrance to the mandapa is by a porch called Artha Mandapa. In a fully formed temple, there may be a transept on each side of the central hall known as the Mahamandapa. A typical example of the fully integrated style may be seen in the Kendri Mahadev temple at Khajuraho in central India. All around the sanctum is a passage meant for circumvallation by the worshippers. The Indian temple is essential through primitive form, is best studied in the early Gupta temple at Sanchi, a cell with a porch in front, the Garbhagre with the Mandapa, 
the typical temple in its simpler form. In some of the southern temples, a small intervening room is added between the cell and the porch called the antrala. The memory of flat roofed Gupta temples is perhaps preserved in the form of a minor shrine of Nandi in the courtyard of the Viprukasha temple at Patadakal, where the flat roof has a small churha or pinnacle at the center. To understand the characteristic of a Hindu temple easily, it is best to do it by taking the example of Khajuraho temple architecture, one of the most developed and refined expression of Indo-Aryan architectural geniuses is to be found in the group of temples at Khajuraho in Bhatemkhan in Madhya Pradesh. Of the 85 temples originally built by the Chandela Rajputs between 1950 and 1050, only about 20 remain in a good state of preservation. Unlike the temples in Orissa, these shrines are not the result of an evolutionary process spread over several centuries, but rather of a brilliant spurt of religious feeling and aesthetic talent. These temples arise like mountains on buff masonry above the dusty plain. The fine-grained variety of sandstone is diverse shades ranging from buff to pink or pale yellow was used in the construction of these temples. These temples belong to the Shaivite, Vaishnavite and Jaina sects. But architecturally, there is a little difference between their styles. Contrary to the custom, these compact lofty structures, Satpatratha in plan, are not enclosed within a wall. They stand on a jagati, a high terrace of solid masonry, which gives added height and prominence. Apart from this, the Khajuraho monuments achieve their architectural effect by their graceful proportions and superb surface decorations. The temple complex consists of Sanctum, the Antrala, the Mandapa and the Ardh Mandapa with the projected portico in front. The plan is generally that of a cross with entrance at the east and one or two transepts radiating from the cellar. Therefore, a temple constituted in this way gives an impression of a unified organism but in some cases, each corner of the Adhisthana was provided by additional shrine, thus forming a Panchayatana group. In journal, it could be said that the massive effectiveness of the shrines at Khajuraho depends upon their beauty of proportion and shape and the lively quality of their surface embellishment. The foremost impression of the Khajuraho shrines is that of a number of separate superstructures, each with its amalaka, finial, forming a great mountain masonry. The vertical is emphasized throughout from the high base through the successive walls and roofs to the ultimate range of lesser peaks that constitute the main spire. These temples may also be regarded as perfect balance of vertical and horizontal volumes with the vertical accent interrupted by friezes of dynamic figure sculptures girdling the entire structure. Symbolically, the temple architecture of Khajuraho is an enlargement of the metaphysical sense nature in the simplest structure of Vedic times. The temples are merely the imitation of Meru, the illusionary world mountain which separates the heaven from the earth as a pillar. At times, the temple structure are also considered equivalent of the body of a Purusha, the universal man whose body comprehends this universe. Accordingly, the final Amalaka is shaped like a lotus, flower or a solar halo with rays typifies the passage of heaven, the sun door at the summit of the world mountain or dome of the skull of the universe man. As we have already seen, the stressed verticality of every architectural member leads the worshipper upwards to that central of magic union with the divine. 
and in like manner the sculptural decoration of the temple points the way to that desired union. This is the meaning implicit in the multiple representation in the phrase of the Mithunas or men and women in erotic embrace, which is the ecstasy typify the ultimate union of the soul with the divine. The reconstitution of the primordial wholeness that was destroyed when Purusha divided himself into a polarity separating human and divine. In its architecture and the spirit underlying it, the temple had not merely to be different from the residence of ordinary man, but had also to dominate its surroundings. The upward thirst of the sanctum tar was symbolic of its spiritual eminence. Nevertheless, it stood solidly and firmly on the ground like a broad-based pyramid amidst supplementary structures, enclosed with a high wall. While the tower loudly announced the presence of God, at close range, the temple overwhelmed the faith by the variety and wealth of the carvings on its walls, pillars and ceilings. The temple itself became one enormous piece of sculpture and its architectural features were often subordinated to the carver's skill. Figures of gods and goddesses, lovely maidens, floral motifs, elephants, horses, chariots, battle scenes, dwarfs and demons, stories from the legends and myths and enough provocative erotic themes. All these sought to picture before the faithful, the righteous way of the gods and the sins of evildoers. In short, the religious faith that the architecture of temple evokes does not spring from a cynical denial of life, but from its warmest depths. In the presentation of this idea, the Hindu temple builder was content to be governed by established conventions rather than his incentive genius. Thus, the architecture of the temple only sought to convey in spatial terms the intensity of their longing to identify the divine with the real. So, to conclude, we can say that Hindu temple is the abode of God and concisely embodies the fundamental morals of Indian life and thought. Thus, a Hindu temple is so designed as to bring about contact between human and the gods. So, with this we come to the end of this lecture and I hope by this time you must have had a clear picture of the Hindu temple. Thank you.